Hello and welcome to this 35 lesson series on building apps for the Windows Phone 8 platform. My name is Bob Tabor and for the past 11 years I've been creating screencast training for Microsoft's developer centric tools and technologies both on Microsoft's web properties like here on Channel 9 and also on my own website www.learnvisualstudio.net. Now according to the title of this series we're going to target this training for absolute beginners and while that is definitely true I mean we're going to begin with the very basics of building apps you'll see that we move very quickly into utilizing new and advanced features on the Windows Phone 8 operating system as well. Now this series was made possible due in large part to the positive response from the original series, the Windows Phone 7 Development for Absolute Beginner series that we created a number of years ago. But we've redesigned this series completely. So if you watch that series in the past, you're not going to recognize a single thing in this new series. There will be a lot of new things to learn. Now before watching this series, you should already be familiar with C Sharp. And if you're not, then I would ask that you please put this series on the back burner for just a few days and instead head on over to Channel 9 C Sharp Fundamentals Development for Absolute Beginners. I designed that series for you, the absolute beginner to C Sharp, in mind. And at a minimum, you're going to need to get the basics of object-oriented programming under your belt, things like classes and properties and methods and visibility modifiers and collections, especially generic collections. You'll need to have that under your belt before you attempt uh, this Windows Phone 8 development series. Now we approach this series uh, as a tutorial. In other words, we're going to teach how to build apps by walking through the steps required to build two full featured apps, one of which that will actually submit to the store. Now hopefully through this approach, you're going to see how big concepts fit together in a real scenario, a real life scenario, real apps that could be submitted to the store. I'm also going to build a number of tiny apps that will illustrate some small concept in hopes that it clarifies some fundamental ideas. Uh, I'm also going to cover things like the operating system and the hardware requirements the software that you're going to need in order to install uh, to get started building uh, Windows Phone 8 apps, how to get a developer license, how to design an app properly, how to submit the app to the store, and so on. So hopefully this is a great starting point as you get started. Now before I actually show you the two apps that we're going to build in this series, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, on screen right now is the uh, is code that's loaded into Visual Studio. The videos are recorded in a high def format, 720p, and so they're crystal clear. So if you can't read the text on my screen right now, that could be because your internet connection can't handle streaming at a high bit rate. Your best option is to use the download link that's beneath every single video. So you can download in various formats and resolutions based on the target device that you want to watch these videos on. And that's true for every video on Channel 9. Next, in order to follow along, you're going to want to download the assets that are contained in a zip file. Now, I'm going to make sure that link is available on this page and every page where the videos are hosted. It'll contain the assets that you need to include in your projects, as well as the finished versions of the app, so that you can compare the code that I've written with the code that you're currently working on. And then finally, for the first time on Channel 9, I'm including a text and screenshot version of the videos. You'll find it posted below each video. Now while these are not necessarily word-by-word -word transcripts of, of what I'm going to say in the videos, they will cover the exact same material and they'll provide the code that I type in so that you can copy and paste it directly into your app. Okay? I'm providing this for those that have a hearing disability or for those who don't use English as their primary language. Also, it should be helpful for reference purposes so that you don't have to go back through and watch the entire video again just to recall some idea or technique that I demonstrated in this series. Okay, so what are we going to build in this series? There's actually two apps, two full featured apps that we're going to build. Let me go ahead and run the first one in the emulator, which we'll talk about uh, in one of the first lessons in this series. This first app is a soundboard app. First of all, it will allow you to move to different pivots to see lists of tiles, each one containing uh, 
WAV files that when you click on the tile, it'll play the appropriate sound. So for example, if we want to hear a duck quack and annoy uh, the animals in our household or our friends or our family, uh, we can hold up this app hit a button and uh, add it to the conversation. Okay, so that's the first app. Also, it has a neat feature. Uh, notice that we have a little app bar here and then we have a little about menu. We're gonna talk about adding that. We're gonna navigate to another page where we can actually record and play back the sounds uh, here then on our, uh, on a special pivot that will contain just the tiles of the sounds that we've recorded using the device. Very cool. So let me stop that and then show you the second app, which is completely different. It's called Around Me, and what it allows you to do is wherever you're standing in the world, you can type in a topic. For example, I'm going to type in the topic um, food and then click the search button and now it'll go off to Flickr, the photo sharing websites uh, web services and it will show me all of the images that match that criteria and so then I can choose uh, it, not just match the criteria of the search term but also photos that were taken in this very place where I'm standing with my phone right now so if I'm at the top as you can see here of the John Hancock Center in Chicago in the observatory I can see what photos other people have taken from that exact same place within a couple of uh, within a couple of meters of where I'm standing and uh, then I can use this multi selection list box here or list uh, group of list items and then click this little check mark and that will make it so that it will use those photos as the lock screen images on my phone. Okay, and so now every 30 minutes or so it will rotate those selected images as the background images for my phone. So we cover a lot of a lot of ground in these two apps talking about a lot of different functionality. Uh, you will learn a lot. Sometimes it'll be a little bit uh, advanced, so you'll have to put your thinking cap on, but I promise you this will be a great learning experience. Okay, and so just to give credit where credit is due here, while I'm the voice and the face that you'll be listening to and looking at for the next 11 hours if you choose to follow this all the way through, this effort was actually a collaboration between a number of parties. First and foremost, Clint Rutkiss of Channel 9 is the mastermind behind the two apps that I just demonstrated that we're going to be building in this series. I think we literally had 100 email threads running about the various, various nuances of the code. He helped me get stuck a number of times. He was patient and very helpful and really deserves the lion's share of the credit for this series. Also, the Windows Phone team supported this effort and made it happen. I think that was due in large part to the warm reception that the previous version of this series received from you, the loyal Channel 9 viewer, so thank you very much. And then finally, Nokia and their developer ambassadors were very helpful in helping me secure the assets I needed in order to put this together. Nokia has stepped up and supported the Windows 8 platform and developers on the platform and I've been nothing but impressed with their passion for what they do. Check out the developer website www.dvlup short for develop.com they offer one-on-one -on -one support, frequent meetups, contests and prizes, and more to get developers like you and me and more engaged in thinking about working together to build this platform. You should register with their site in order to get started. And that brings me to this. I am in love with my Nokia Lumia 920. Without a doubt, this is the coolest device that I have ever owned. And trust me, I own several of the most popular devices on other platforms that are available on the market today. If you're interested in Windows Phone 8 development, it's not a requirement, but I think that you're really going to want to own one of these phones. It's not just a great developer test bed for the apps that you build, but it's also a great device. Uh, I've been given permission to tell you about my favorite features, so let me tell you that first of all, it has an awesome camera purely from a user perspective here. In fact, my wife is constantly asking me to send her pics that I take with my phone. Our son just graduated high school a couple of weeks ago. And she asked me, hey, send me all those pics. Because her 
I mean, her less capable foam just doesn't compare, especially in low light situations. Uh, it also has NFC, the near field communications capability, so I was able to share with my friends using a whole other platform, uh, a device on another platform, we were able to exchange information just by tapping our phones together. That was cool. Uh, also, uh, specifically for the Windows Phone 8 platform or, uh, or Windows phones in general, is the ability to pin things to the start page. My favorite albums, my favorite websites that I visit every day, any apps that I want to use, I can pin them and get to them instantly without having to search through mountains of other apps I might have installed on my device. Uh, and then not only that, but some apps have live tiles. I'm sure you've heard that, that phrase before. I seek out apps that update the tiles on the start page with new information. And sometimes I do that so I won't have to open up the app. Sometimes I just do it because I want to spice up my, my start page uh, so I can see weather or my calendar or the countdown to my vacation right there on my start page. Okay, and here's my absolute favorite feature. I'm now charging my phone. Wireless charging is awesome. Yes, most pl uh, phones have the ability to buy a case that will allow you to do this, but it's built right into this phone. That is awesome. Also, I can do voice commands easily. I just hold down the start button on the face of the phone. Uh, so I can create one note to do items that, that sync perfectly with SkyDrive and sync with my uh, OneNote on my desktop machine. Uh, I can also send a text message while I'm on the road and I, I don't have to take my hands off the wheel. All right, so there's, uh, there's also other cool things about this platform. First of all, it's growing. Uh, every time I do a demo uh, of my phone, I convert another user. I've got my family and my friends converted that this is gonna be their next phone whenever their contract comes up for renewal. And I just read a great article, actually right here at this URL, uh, that uh, about the growth of the enterprise market for app builders. And that's really exciting, to leverage this skill set and be able to build apps for large enterprises. And the best feature of all, at least in my opinion, is the fact that I can leverage my existing C Sharp and .NET and Windows runtime experience into building apps that I can carry around with me. Yeah, I suppose that if I wanted to create apps for another platform, I could spend a few weeks or months learning a new language, learning a new API, and so on. Or I could build apps that try to target all platforms but miss key new features unique to the Windows Phone 8 operating system. But this, this feels natural and easy, and so it's really fun. So if you're just getting started with Windows Phone 8 development, I'm sure that you'll soon share my excitement. This series, at least in my humble opinion, is one of the best ways to get up to speed quickly. So promise me this, if you follow along with this series and you're trying to build the apps as I'm building the apps, if you get stuck or something just doesn't make sense to you, please ask a question in the comments area at the very bottom of this page. Either Clint or I, or perhaps somebody else who's working through the same material, will try to help you get unstuck moving forward quickly. So let's go ahead and get started in the next lesson by setting up our environment, and then we're going to begin writing code immediately. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. Now, before you can develop Windows Phone 8 apps, you're going to need to install the Windows Phone 8 SDK or Software Development Kit and you'll need to install it on a computer that's running Windows 8 64-bit edition. Now the reason for this requirement is the Windows Phone emulator. It's running as a virtual machine in Hyper-V which is Microsoft's virtualization platform. So you'll be running the Windows Phone 8 operating system in a little window that looks just like a phone on your desktop for the purpose of testing your work. So you're running a little computer inside of your larger computer, okay? So to be clear, if you're not sitting at a computer with Windows 8 64-bit edition at this moment, then you're gonna need to install that first in order to continue with this series, or more importantly, you're gonna need it in order to build Windows Phone 8 apps and to install the uh, Windows Phone 8 SDK. 
Now, if you're not sure which version of Windows 8 your computer is currently running, then you can go to the control panel. And I think the easiest way to get to that is just to go to the search charm and type in control and, oh, it'll pop up there in the results. I'll just hit the enter key on my keyboard. And in the control panel, I'm gonna select the system and security option and then the system option. And this will show me which version or system type I'm running it, the 64-bit operating system on an X64 based processor. Great. Okay, so what I want to do is save you a little bit of time and expense here. If you're running a previous version of Windows, let's say Windows 7, and it's the 32-bit edition, you simply cannot use the Windows Upgrade Advisor uh, in order to install or upgrade to Windows 8 electronically. Instead, what you're going to need to do is purchase the Windows Pro Upgrade DVD. Now, for a more thorough explanation of this in every possible scenario imaginable, check out Paul Thorat's posting at this URL. But in any case, in my case, I purchased the OEM version of Windows 8 64-bit Pro. Now, I was concerned that I, could, that I couldn't do a clean install of uh, using the upgrade because uh, I wanted to just blow away my current operating system and start over from scratch. However, that apparently is not the case and I could have saved a few bucks with the upgrade option, okay? So also I want to make sure that you understand that there's a difference between Windows 8 64-bit edition and Windows 8 Pro. There's actually a kind of a combination of, uh, of, of these. So you have the Windows 8 64-bit Pro, Windows 8 64-bit, Windows 8 32-bit Pro, Windows 8 32-bit. Now, for the purpose of developing, uh, developing Windows Phone apps, you don't need the Pro option. Just make sure whatever you choose, it's the 64-bit edition, okay? Next, what you're gonna need to do is download and install the Windows Phone 8 SDK. Now, if you already have Visual Studio 2012, so one of the paid versions, I think there's a standard, but I use professional or greater. Uh, the installer will merely add the tools required for phone development. If you don't have Visual Studio 2012, the paid edition already installed, then the Windows Phone 8 SDK will automatically install Window, uh, Visual Studio 2012 Express for Windows Phone 8. This will provide a single task version of Visual Studio that's meant specifically for Windows Phone 8 development. So you won't get the tools to create Windows 8 store apps, you know, like uh, you can see here and you can go in the store uh, right here. You won't be able to build those apps with that version. Of course, you can download a whole different free edition of Visual Studio for that purpose. You also won't be able to build Windows Presentation Foundation apps for building desktop apps like you would, you'd run here on the desktop. You won't be able to build ASP.NET web apps and so on, all right? So it's single purpose. Uh, and so I'm gonna be using this version, uh, the Visual Studio 2012 Express for Windows Phone 8 for the remainder of this video series, but I assure you that the experience is almost identical to using Visual Studio 2012 Professional or Greater with the Windows Phone 8 SDK installed. Phew, okay. Uh, so you can get the, uh, the Windows Phone 8 SDK from this URL on screen right now, developer.windowsphone.com. Uh, you can obviously get uh, different language versions. I'm pointing you to the English version, so just make sure you go to the start at developer.windowsphone.com and navigate through and you'll find the tools that you need. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're already familiar with downloading and running an installer, so I'm not gonna walk through that process here. I think that's a little bit of a waste of time. But during installation, you might see a message that looks something like this. All right, it'll say, uh, give you a warning that hardware virtualization is disabled on this PC. You must enable it through the BIOS settings. For more information, see this MSDN article. Actually, uh, there's a different article that you're going to need to take a look at. Uh, you're going to enable, basically, your motherboard to run Hyper-V. So take a look at this article, how to enable Hyper-V for Windows Phone Emulator uh, on screen, or search for it in Bing.com. Now, in my case, I recently built my own machine and I used the, uh, the Asus Sabertooth Z77 
uh, which is a high-end military upgrade uh, uh, motherboard. I don't even know what that means, but it sounded cool. So it had the other features I wanted on it. And it's also running the, uh, the uh, i7, the Intel i7-3770K, which fits in an LGA 1155 socket. Uh, most importantly, it supports Intel's hyper-threading technology. Uh, I just have to tell my motherboard that I want to turn it on. And so in the BIOS for my motherboard, I had to enable Hyper-V by going to the advanced settings and then the advanced tab and then look through the possible settings. Now, in my case, it was called hyper-threading. Uh, now, uh, admittedly, this might all sound a little bit scary, but it's a one-time change. And after I work past the terminology and how to actually get into my BIOS, you know, I don't do that every day, it all went really smoothly. So don't be scared away by that step in the process. And I assure you that every motherboard will be a little bit different. Every, uh, um, uh, every version of BIOS will be maybe a tiny bit different. It might depend on which, uh, which um, chip you're using as well. Uh, what I would recommend is this. If you're not sure how to do this for your particular brand of computer, just run the SDK installer and follow its instructions. It's possible that you won't need to do anything special at all. But if you do need to do something special, if you see that little warning, then it's very possible that somebody else in the world with the exact same computer that you have has worked through this issue and has already been kind enough to blog about it, okay? So here's where good searching skills on the internet with a search engine like Bing.com is an invaluable skill. Uh, just a few minutes, and heck, even an hour researching this can save you headaches of trying to figure it out yourself if you're not comfortable already with doing it. And as a last resort, you could contact the manufacturer of your computer to simply ask how to enable hyper-threading in the BIOS. Uh, they should be able to point you to a knowledge-based article on how to perform this operation. Okay, as the old expression goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I was able to successfully install Windows Phone 8 SDK and Visual Studio 2012 Express for Windows Phone on a Mac Pro running OSX Mountain Lion and VMware Fusion, the latest version. I just made sure that whenever I created the virtual machine that it was 64-bit uh, and prior to installing the operating system I set up the processors and the memory in VMware Fusion uh, and I gave it plenty of cores and plenty of memory and made sure that the enable hypervisor applications in this virtual machine option is checked like you see on screen. Now I can't remember, it's been a couple of weeks ago since I did this, but uh, I can't remember if you need the enable code profiling applications I, uh, in this virtual machine checked. It's been a month since I set this up, like I said, uh, but it works with it turned on, so I recommend you leave that setting on too, okay? Uh, and I only bring up the Mac running the VMware solution for this reason. If there's a will, there's a way. What seems hard is usually pretty easy. Just need to know which options to configure and you'll be on your way. Again, Bing.com can be your best friend in cases like this. So after you work through these requirements, you're ready to get started and follow along in this series and to begin building Windows Phone 8 apps. And so we're going to begin doing that in the next video. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. Uh, now that we have the tools that we need installed, we're ready to get started in building our first Windows Phone 8 app. So here's our game plan in this lesson. The first thing we'll do is create a new Windows Phone app using the uh, project templates in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Express 2012 for Windows Phone like I'll use in this series. We're going to make some simple edits to the default page that's added to our project called MainPage.xaml. We're going to remove some boilerplate comments. We're going to add a media control which will allow us to play a sound and we'll add a button to the user interface so that a user could click on the button. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll write an event handler in C-sharp that will respond to the button click event. So when a user touches the button, we want to be able to write C-sharp code that will handle that event. And inside of that event handler, we're going to then play a WAV file, uh, a duck's quack, okay? Uh, just so we can see it all working and we'll have that finished in this short lesson. 
So hopefully some of the basic steps like creating new projects, adding new files to a project and so on are already familiar to you whether from personal experience or from watching some of the other fundamentals or absolute beginner series on channel 9. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain things I think you already should know. If that's not familiar to you, like I said at the outset of this series of lessons, then please take the time to first review the C Sharp for Absolute Beginner series here on channel 9. All right, so this will look a little bit different depending on whether you're in Visual Studio Pro or uh, the Express Edition, but essentially you want to go File, New, Project, one way or another, to get to the New Project dialog. Uh, we'll want to use the C Sharp templates, the Windows Phone templates on the left. In the center area, you want to select the Windows Phone app template, and then we're going to rename this project Pet sounds and then click the OK button and you'll see this little dialog that pops up it'll allow us to choose between different versions of the operating system that we can target uh, but since this series is only targeting the Windows Phone operating system version 8.0 uh, then just make sure you have this latter option selected. Uh, just so you know, you can create apps that target previous versions of Windows Phone, uh, the Windows Phone operating system, uh, if you want to expand your app's reach to owners of older phone devices. You'll just have no access to the newer features that were added into version 8.0. All right, so let's go ahead and click OK. And I'll take just a few moments to set up the project and to load the template into uh, the design area. You'll notice, first of all, that these screens are called pages, as in the main page.xaml. So in our first steps, we're only going to work with a single page, but in other apps, we're going to add pages and then be able to navigate between them. So I assume that you've never worked with a Windows Phone project template before. And so if that's the case, then what you see here is just the representation of the main page.xaml. It's loaded into the visual designer, and there are two parts. On the left-hand side, you see the visual designer surface. And while you could use this as your primary means of laying out and adding controls to your Windows Phone app, you can go to the toolbox and, like for example, add a button, drag and drop it from the toolbox onto the designer surface. I primarily only use this designer surface, let me delete that button, uh, as just feedback for whatever I do in the XAML editor here on the right hand side. Let's resize this and I'm going to actually change the zoom level to like 50% so that we can see more of that. A little housekeeping here. All right, so here on the right hand side, I typically write all of my XAML by hand. So the changes that I make in the XAML code will be reflected then in the visual designer. And vice versa, if I were to use the toolbox to drag and drop controls onto the design surface, you'll see them reflected in the XAML editor as well. So these are just two perspectives of the same thing. They represent the same idea, main page. Okay, uh, And so you can see between these two panes, there's a number of different options to like switch the panes back and forth and things of that nature. I'll let you go ahead and play around with these. and They're pretty self-explanatory. If you just take a moment to play around with them, you understand what they're there for. Uh, however, since it's not really critical to our lesson, I just want to move ahead really quickly. In the XAML pane, what I want to do next is remove two large comment passages, this boilerplate comments that are added here uh, by default. And that reminds me, while I'm looking at this XAML editor, what I want to do is make sure that you have uh, the line numbering turned on in your version of Visual Studio or the Express Edition. So we're going to go to Tools options and we're going to want to drill down to the text editor section here on the left and there are two things that we want to change in the C sharp text editor we want to make sure that line numbers is selected like you see here and then I'm going to go to the XAML portion uh, for the text editor uh, and then make sure that line numbers are turned on there as well and then click OK. And this will allow us to keep in sync uh, so that you can see what I'm seeing on screen. And if something doesn't sync up, or I can reference, uh, I'll take a look at line 36, for example. OK? All right. So uh, what I want to do is remove these comments. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory if you take time to, uh, to, to read them. Uh, and we'll actually follow some of these a little bit later on. But notice that comments 
are added to XAML using the same uh, the same syntax that you would use in HTML. So there's an open angle bracket, an exclamation mark, and a dash dash. That is to open the comment. And to close the comment, you see a dash dash close angle bracket. So we're just gonna wanna use our mouse cursor to select the entire area and then hit the delete key on our keyboard. And we can remove some of that white space as well. And we'll do the same thing uh, here as well. I'm just gonna select all of the comments, you can notice uh, by default they're in green, so it's easy to visually identify them. All right, and so the next thing that we want to do is I'm going to begin to work with uh, this area here, beginning in line 29 on my screen. It might be a little bit different on yours. Uh, this content panel area, it's a grid. There's an open grid element with some attributes set and a closed grid element. And we're gonna to wanna to do our work right between there. This will allow us to make changes in this content panel area of our, of our user interface. Notice that there's also this title panel here. Uh, and if I select it, you can see its selection is made here in approximately line number 25, where we can change the title of the app and the page's name on line number 26 if we want to. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But what we want to do right now is we're going to add some new XAML code between the opening and closing grid elements that comprise our content panel. Okay, so here we go. We're going to add a button by using an open and close angle bracket syntax just like you would see in HTML. So we're just going to type in the word button and then the close angle bracket. When I do that, notice that Visual Studio adds a second bracket. That bracket has the word slash button, which indicates an open and a closing button. And so everything in between here will be what will appear inside of the button. So I'm going to type in the word quack. Okay. And now on the left hand side in the designer, you can see that we have an entire uh, content panel filled with a quack button. Now that's simply not going to do. What we're going to want to do is restrict the size of the button by setting a height and a width attribute. And so what I'll do is go just inside of the open button element. And I'm going to type the word height equals 200. And then I'm going to use the enter key on my keyboard right after the closing quotation mark after the number 200, but before the closing, closing angle bracket. And I'm going to go to the next line and this will allow me to keep all the attributes that I use kind of lined up together and it'll appear more readable, uh, at least for me. Uh, you can choose not to do that. It doesn't really matter. But I'm going to uh, set the width now to 200 and when I do that and I spell the word width correctly, there we go. Now you can see that our button only takes up 200 pixels by 200 pixels of screen real estate. Great. Now what I want to do next is move that button control to the upper left hand corner of the page uh, beneath the page title and I want to also make its background color red. And I'm going to do one more thing too um, and I'm going to give it a name and I'll talk about why I want to do that here in just a moment but name equals play audio button. And then the next thing I'm going to do is set the horizontal alignment equal to uh, left and the vertical alignment equal to top. And then finally, I'm going to choose background equal red. Great. All right. So you can see that uh, that's made some dramatic changes to our button on our user interface. I gave the button control a name so that I can reference it programmatically in C sharp. Uh, so giving controls names is optional in XAML. You only need to give things names that you want to allow access somehow in C Sharp. Uh, I know I want to access this button a little bit later, so I give it a programmatic name now. Now the visual designer updates to show the effects of our changes. That's a great start and you can see that we can manipulate the visual qualities of objects in our Windows Phone page by setting attributes on those objects. All right. All right, so next let's add a media element control to the XAML page, uh, and we'll do that beneath our button control. So I'm gonna to go to the closing bracket of the button, or the closing button element, and I'm gonna type in media element, and I'm gonna give it a name as well. Notice I use X colon name, I'll talk about that in an upcoming video. And I'm gonna call this quack media 
element and I'm going to set its source equal to an empty double quotes and then I'm going to use a different style syntax this time instead of typing uh, slash media element to close it I'm just going to use the open bracket with the slash uh, close bracket so it's a self enclosing uh, uh, element in XAML all right and uh, notice that I can add extra white space and extra lines between my XAML code and it won't harm anything. As you'll learn a little bit later, Visual Studio will automatically indent and space the code for readability. However, it won't impact how it's rendered on the actual application's user interface. Okay. Uh, also, I've not set the source attribute of the media element just yet. That's because I don't have any sources, in other words, any media elements like sound files in my project to choose from. So let's start and do that next. So make sure that you've downloaded the assets that uh, accompany this video. You can download them from the place where you're currently watching this video or where you uh, originally downloaded it from. So I've unzipped uh, that file into a, uh, into a folder called C9 Phone 8 and I put it in my documents directory. And inside of that you can see that there are three subfolders. Uh, what we want to do is go to this Pet Sounds Assets folder, and what I want to do is uh, I'm going to drag and drop the audio subfolder into our project, but I want to make sure that it goes to the right place. So I want to go to this Assets folder in Solution Explorer and just expand it so I can see it. You can see that it already has a tile subfolder and a couple of other PNG files. And so now what I want to do is this. I'm going to drag and drop the audio folder here into the assets folder in the solution explorer here and you can see now it has included all of those audio files and there's a subfolder under audio called animals and then there are a number of wave files these are actually sound files uh, that we can then play in our app very cool and so what I want to do is I want to access a specific one we're going to use this one called duck.wav uh, and I'm going to add that as a value for the source attribute uh, in my media element XAML or yeah media element XAML element so what I'll do to reference it is go here in the source I'm going to use a forward slash assets forward slash audio forward slash animal so I'm just repeating that folder structure forward slash duck dot wave all right and I'm also going to add a couple of additional attributes for example uh, volume I'll set that equal to one and I'm going to set autoplay equal to false like so okay so hopefully the source made sense we're just following this path relative to the main page.xaml in our project so if you think about the main page.xaml at kind of the root of our project then in order to to navigate down the directory structure of assets audio animals and then finally the file we're looking for which is duck.wave we use a series of forward slashes just like we would if we were trying to navigate um, you know into a, into a uh, into a website all right uh, next you can see that I set the volume equal to one this seems like a small value but in XAML that's actually the highest or in this case the loudest value so uh, in XAML you'll see 0.0, .0 used as the smallest value and 1.0 used as the largest value available and then 0.5 is halfway it's somewhere in between uh, and it's always uh, the C sharp uh, data type double in this case even if I don't represent it with a 1.0 that's essentially what it means all right uh, and then finally you'll see that I added this autoplay equals false uh, if I set this to true then the duck.wave sound file would play immediately as my app is loaded and that's not what I want I want to trigger the playback of that wave file when I click the quack button and so what we need to do is write code next to accomplish that 
All right, so in the buttons XAML element, what I wanna do is this, and watch closely. I'm gonna type in click equals, and when I do that, notice there's a little helper window that appears below it that says new event handler. I'm gonna go ahead and use the enter key on my keyboard, or the return key, since that is highlighted in blue, and it will automatically generate for me a name of an event handler in a C-sharp file. So the name of that method is going to be play audio button underscore click. All right, very cool. Uh, and so next what I wanna do is write code that'll execute when somebody clicks on this button. We want this play audio button click method to fire. Uh, and so what I wanna do is right click anywhere in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and right click on this uh, inside of the button and select navigate to event handler. And when I do that, you can see that that a page called the main page .cs will open up in uh, the main area. Now, if you take a look at in the solution explorer, we have main page .xaml. If I were to use a little arrow next to it, you can see that it has a relationship with another file called main page .xaml .cs. If you're new to creating Windows, web, or now phone apps in Visual Studio, you'll come to realize that there's two parts to these pages that we're creating. There's the XAML and the design view, which allows us to write declarative code or XAML code. And then there's a related code view with a .cs file extension that allows us to define the behavior by writing c -sharp code. These are two halves of the same concept. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. In Visual Studio, your cursor should be located between the uh, opening and closing curly braces for this play audio button underscore click. Uh, and so since this code block will execute whenever somebody taps on the quack button on the phone, we want to trigger the media element to play the sound that we've set in the source attribute, namely that quack.wav file. So we're gonna write code to play that sound. So uh, quack media element dot play, we'll call the play method. Uh, and so here what I'm doing is I'm just using the media elements name, quack media element that we set in XAML to access it programmatically. Then I wanna call its play method to kick off the playback of the source, or in other words, the quack.wav file. So let's go ahead and save what we have and we're gonna test the app. Again, this should be familiar to you. You're gonna run the application in debug mode the same way that you would run a console application that we created in the C Sharp uh, Fundamentals or Absolute Beginner series. You'll either do that by clicking the little run button next to this word emulator, which we'll talk about later, or you can hit the F5 key on your keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this button. And what you see next is the window phone emulator. It's a virtual machine that's running the full Windows Phone 8 operating system. In other words, the operating system actually thinks it's running on a physical phone device. However, it's virtual in the sense that Microsoft created software that mimics the phone hardware in every way. So we're gonna be using the phone emulator extensively in this series as it's easier than deploying uh, our test to a physical phone each time that we wanna test the code that we've written or uh, test a change that we've made. You're gonna learn more about the features of the phone emulator in this series and a whole lesson devoted to it, all right? So what we wanna do is we're gonna use the mouse to simulate using your finger to tap on the screen of the phone. And what we wanna do is uh, uh, click the little red quack button. <laughs> Okay, if your computer is set up to hear audio, you'll hear a duck's quack through the speakers, uh, your headset or speakers, and I happen to hear it here, uh, even though I'm not playing it out loud through speakers. Uh, so then to stop debugging, what we wanna do is go back to Visual Studio, which should be behind it, and we're gonna click the little red square button on the toolbar, and that will stop uh, the application from running. But you'll notice that the emulator is still running in the background and that's okay. Go ahead and let it continue to run. It's fine, especially if you're gonna continue on to the next lesson in the series. Okay, so to quickly recap, in just one lesson, we created a simple soundboard app. We learned how to create a Windows Phone project, how to modify the declarative XAML code to add and configure controls. We learned how to add assets to the project and how to reference them in our code. 
and how to add event handlers to respond to certain events that are triggered by the end user, in this case a button click. We learned how the main page.xaml and the main page.xaml.cs are related. And we're going to learn more about that in upcoming lessons. We learned how to trigger methods of the controls to play sound whenever a user taps the button. Finally, we learned about the Windows Phone emulator as a means of testing our apps in a virtual environment. However, there's a lot to talk about now. If you're new to XAML, it's really important for you to have a solid foundation with it. So in the next lesson, I want to talk about the features of XAML and build on those throughout the remainder of this series. As I said at the outset, many of the lessons that you learn here will transfer over to all of the APIs in, uh, that Microsoft provides that utilize XAML, such as Windows Presentation Foundation and Windows Store Apps. So it's crucial that you get XAML under your belt. Okay, so we'll pick it up in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, I want to talk about the XAML syntax that we wrote in our first pass at the Pet Sounds project. Uh, hopefully you could see how the XAML that we wrote impacted what we saw in the preview pane for our main page.xaml. Uh, it's relatively easy to figure out the absolute basics of XAML just by looking at it, right? However, I want to point out some of its features and functions that may not be so obvious, at least at first glance. So at a high level, our game plan is this. Uh, we're going to talk about the purpose and the nature of XAML, comparing it to C Sharp. And then we're going to talk about the special features of XAML, little hidden features that may not be so obvious by just staring at it for a while. So my aim is that by the end of this lesson, you're going to have enough knowledge that you can look at XAML that we write in the rest of the series and be able to make a pretty good guess of what it's trying to do even before I tell you what it's doing. All right. Uh, so in the previous lesson, I made this passing remark about XAML and how it looks similar to HTML. That's no accident. XAML is really just XML, the extensible markup language. I'll explain that relationship in just a moment, but at a higher level, XAML looks like HTML in so much that they share a common ancestry. Whereas X, uh, HTML is specific to structuring a web page document, XML is more generic. And by generic, I mean that you can use it for any purpose that you devise. You can define the names and the elements of the attributes to suit your needs. So in the past, developers have used XML for things like storing application settings or using it as a means of transferring data between two systems that were never intended to talk to each other. So to use XML, you define a schema which declares the proper names of elements and their attributes. A schema is kind of like a contract. Everybody agrees to the contract, both the producer of the XML and the consumer of the XML. They agree to write and to read the syntax of a particular uh, flavor of XML uh, in a specific way to conform to the rules that are set up in the schema. So they agree to abide by the rules of the contract. Now they can communicate with each other because they have common rules that they, that they abide by. So a schema is an important part of XML. And just keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. X, uh, XAML is a special usage of XML. Now obviously we see that, at least in this case, XAML has something to do with defining a user interface uh, in our phone's UI, uh, phone app's UI. So in that regard, it feels very much like HTML, but there's a huge difference. XAML is actually used to create instances of classes and set the values of properties. So for example, in the previous lesson, we defined a button control like so, right? Uh, and if we were to try to recreate this one element, uh, this button element, with all of its attribute settings and everything in C Sharp, it would look something like this. And give me just a minute because I'll be doing a lot of typing here, okay? Just to, to prove my point.
Okay, so as you can see, I added the C-sharp code in the constructor of my main page class. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the relationship in a little bit more depth. We already kind of alluded to it in the previous lesson, how there's a relationship between the main page.xaml and the main page.xaml.cs, that they're two parts of the uh, of one whole. Uh, we'll talk about that more in just a moment, but uh, we can, uh, we've already seen how we can define the, uh, the user interface in the XAML page and then define the behavior of the various uh, XAML elements in our main page.xaml.cs by writing procedural C sharp code. So here I'm merely writing code that will execute as soon as a new instance of the main class or the main page class is created by writing code in its constructor of that class. So at this point now, I have two buttons, one defined declaratively in XAML that has the content quack and will quack whenever we click a button, and a second button that has the content of meow. And so when we run the button, or run the app, we only see one button. Why did that happen? Well, that's because the button that we just created procedurally in C Sharp in the constructor of our main page class is sitting on top of our previous button that we defined in XAML. Uh, and so just to prove it, what I want to do is add one more line of code that will move our new button out uh, to the right-hand side. So uh, here's what we'll do. All right, so the margin property of the button class is of type thickness. And thickness is general, a general purpose class that represents four dimensions. In this case, we create a new thickness class and set its first value, uh, the first input parameter uh, argument, to 210 pixels. And so when we run the application again, you can see that we now see both buttons because it moved that meow button over to 210 pixels uh, to the right-hand side. So the larger issue is that we have two almost identical buttons, one created declaratively in XAML and the other pro created procedurally in C Sharp. When I create a new XAML element using the, uh, this open and close element syntax like so, open button, close button syntax, I'm basically creating a new instance of the button class. When I set attributes like you see here, on a button element, I'm basically setting the properties on that instance of the button class. So the important takeaway is this. XAML is simply a way to create instances of classes and to set those objects properties in a much more simplified, succinct syntax. What took us, look, how many lines of code here? Well, maybe like 10 lines of code in C Sharp, we were able to accomplish in just essentially one line of XAML. Even if I did separate it onto different lines in my editor, it's still much shorter than it would have been had I used C Sharp to create all of my objects. Furthermore, using XAML, I've got this immediate feedback in the phone's uh, the designer preview pane. I can see the impact of my changes instantly. In the case of the procedural C Sharp code I wrote, I'd have to run the app each time that I wanted to see how my little tweaks actually impacted the, uh, the layout of the app and all of its, all of its uh, interface elements. All right, so if you have a keen eye, you might notice the difference in XAML and the C Sharp versions of the buttons that I created when it comes to the horizontal alignment property. So you can see horizontal alignment equals left, vertical alignment equals top. And if we were to take a look here uh, in our C Sharp version, we're actually creating instances of uh, system.windows.verticalalignment.top as an enumeration. What if I were to change, for example, this horizontal alignment from system.windows.horizontalalignment.left to just the string left. If I were to attempt that, you see a red squiggly line immediately, and if I were to try to uh, build our project, our solution, we're gonna get an error, a compilation error, cannot implicitly convert type string to system.windows.horizontalalignment, all right? So uh, the XAML parser will perform a conversion to turn this string of left or top uh, 
through the use uh, into the value system.windows.horizontalalignment.left in this case through the use of something called a type converter. A type converter is a class that can translate from a string value into a strong type. And there are several of these that are built into the Windows 8 uh, Phone 8 API that we're going to use throughout this series. In this example, the horizontal alignment property, when it was developed by Microsoft's developers, was marked with a special attribute in the source code, which signals to the XAML parser to run the string through, uh, through a type converter method to try and match up the literal string left with the enumeration value of system.windows.horizontalalignment.left. All right, so just to show you what happens uh, if you were to try and misspell the word left, here I'll just take the L off of left, and notice that we get a, a blue squiggly line under the word horizontal alignment. How is it? How does it know that uh, it's just a string value, right? I should be able to type anything in here. I should even be able to type Bob, and it would take it and maybe give me some kind of runtime error at uh, uh, while I'm actually running the app. But you get a compilation error because the type converter can't find an exact match that it can convert into the enumeration value system.windows.horizontalalignment.left. So let's go ahead and change that back. All right. So the first characteristic of XAML is that it's a succinct means of creating instances of classes. In the context of building a Windows Phone 8 application, uh, it's used to create instances of user interface elements. However, XAML is not just a user interface technology. It could be used for other purposes in other technologies, and it is, as a matter of fact. All right, so next up, let's talk about all that XAML code at the very top. Before I forget, let me go ahead and change this back as well, because this isn't going to work. If we try it again, something about Windows, dot Windows, dot Horizontal Alignment, dot Left. There we go. Okay. So now let's move over to the main page, dot XAML. And uh, let's take a look at the very top of that file, uh, where we see this phone colon phone application page and it's just one really really long element uh, declaration if we look at the very bottom we can find its corresponding closing element okay so what's the purpose of this well while you're looking this over remember what I said a moment ago about schemas being a big part of XML if that's the case then where does this XAML promise to adhere to a schema well take a look at lines three through eight these lines of code right here there are actually six schemas that this main page dot XAML is promising to adhere to each of them are defined with this XML NS attribute the first XML NS or XML namespace defined in line three is the default namespace in other words there's no colon and no word after it like we see in the ones that follow it below all right so the rest of the namespaces here in lines number four through eight, uh, uh, they use the name, XML namespace, and a colon, and another value. Uh, so just to be clear, the colon X, or the colon phone, or the colon shell, uh, is the namespace that's associated with a given schema, uh, what we called a contract earlier. So each element and attribute in the rest of this main page.xaml must adhere to at least one of these schemas that are defined at the very top of this XML document. Otherwise, the document is said to be invalid. In other words, if there's an element or attribute expressed in this XAML file that's not defined in one of these namespaces, then there's no guarantees that the compiler which is the program that will parse through all of this code and, and uh, will create an executable that will run on the phone, there's no guarantees that the compiler will be able to understand how to carry out that particular instruction. So for ex in this example, uh, in our grid, our content panel grid, all right, uh, we have this uh, grid and then x name equals content panel and so forth. We would expect that this element grid would be a part of the default schema corresponding with the default namespace located here in line number three. However, its name, this x colon name equals content panel, we would expect it to be defined as part of this namespace here 
because it is prefixed with the letter X, which is defined in line number four here at the top. All right, so I have a bright idea. Let's try to navigate to this default namespace. I mean, it's HTTP colon slash slash, you know, some schemas.microsoft.com. Let's take a look at what a schema actually looks like. So let's uh, select it. I'm going to hit Control C on my keyboard. I'm going to open up Internet Explorer here. And I'm going to paste in the URL. And whoops, an error occurred while processing your request. Well, what in the world just happened? Well, the schema doesn't actually exist at that URL. That's because a schema is not published in the sense that you can go to that URL and view it. Instead, a schema is simply a unique name, similar to how we use namespaces in C Sharp to identify two classes that might have the same name, uh, the schema, and therefore the namespace in our XAML keeps class names sorted out, kind of like a last name or a surname. So this URL, or more properly, we should refer to it as a URI, a Uniform Resource Identifier, rather than a URL, which is a Uniform Resource Locator. So this URI is used as a namespace identifier. The XML namespaces are simply instructions to the various applications that will parse through the XAML. Uh, with the, the Windows Runtime XAML parser will be seeking to turn it into executable code, while the Visual Studio and Blend designers will be seeking to turn it into a design time experience. So the second XML namespace defines a mapping, this colon X, as belonging to this schema schemas.microsoft.com slash winfx slash 2006 slash XAML. Therefore, any attributes or element names that are preceded by the X prefix means that they adhere to this second schema. So what's the difference? Well, it's subtle, but the second schema defines the intrinsic rules for XAML in general. The first schema, our default schema, is actually uh, defines the contract or the rules for Windows Phone 8 specific usage of XAML. In other words, uh, the fact that we can work with the grid or the button or the media element and the other Windows Phone 8 XAML elements without using a prefix means that they're def defined in the default namespace. All right, so now let's take a look at lines number five and six. Uh, you can see that they're at a different URI, one that takes its cues from the Microsoft.phone CLR namespace and are defined in assemblies called Microsoft.phone. And these were installed on our computers when we installed the Windows Phone API 8.0. Uh, so you can see actually where this phone prefix is used here for the phone application page. Uh, if we were to take a look at phone application page, let me just do a quick little bit of investigative journalism here. And let's search for this in bing.com and find this in uh, on MSDN and let's take a look at the the hierarchy you can see that as we work our way back through this from microsoft.phone.controls.phone application page of course this microsoft.phone.controls uh, which we see uh, here is the namespace that uh, it derives from system.windows.controls.page and it works its way back all the way to system.object but this system.windows.controls.page is uh, actually used by other uh, frameworks like the Windows Presentation Foundation page classes and Windows Store apps so for Windows 8 apps uh, the uh, those uh, page classes as well so a lot of the base functionality base functionality is shared by all three of these project types WPF, Windows Store Apps, and now Windows Phone Apps. So the upside is that you're able to leverage what you learn in this series of building, uh, of building Windows Phone Apps to also WPF, Desktop Apps, and Windows Store Apps as well. Of course, there will be differences, but there's a lot in common too, and so we can trace that lineage back. Uh, but at any rate, um, these namespaces are defined in uh, as CLR namespaces, all right, instead of this HTTP syntax. Line seven and eight here, you can see they define uh, namespaces and schemas that are used to allow Visual Studio's uh, phone preview pane on the left to display properly. These instructions are ignored at runtime, which is what line number nine is doing right here. Uh, so 
when compiling the XAML code, ignore anything that's prefixed with the letter D. All right. Okay, so I know that there are some questions that are left unanswered, and we could spend a lot of time talking about the specifics, but the main takeaway here is that the code at the very top of the XAML file that you add to your phone project does have a purpose. It defines the rules that your XAML code must follow. You'll almost never need to modify any of this code, but if you remove it, you could potentially break your application. So I would encourage you to not fiddle around with it unless you have a really good reason to do so. Uh, and, and there are a number of additional attributes that we see here in lines 10 through 14. We're going to talk about them later on in this series. All right, so in Visual Studio Solution Designer, or I'm sorry, Solution Explorer, uh, you can see that the XAML files have an arrow next to them, like I pointed out in the previous le lesson. So for this main page dot XAML, there's also a little uh, arrow that will allow us to drill down and see that there's a relationship with this main page dot XAML dot CS file. The only difference is that it has this dot CS file extension. Uh, if you look at the CS version of the file, you'll see that it defines the main page class. And furthermore, it defines it as a partial class, all right? And so the other half of the equation is defined in lines one and two of mainpage.xaml, where we have this class equal petsounds.mainpage. Now, while it doesn't use the term partial like its procedural counterpart here, uh, it does indicate the relationship between the two. So why is this important? Well, this relationship means that the compiler will com combine the output of the main page.xaml and the main page.xaml.cs files into a single class. This means that these are two parts of a whole. That's an important concept, that the XAML gets compiled into intermediate language just like C Sharp gets compiled into intermediate language, and they both are partial implementations of a single class. So this allows you to create an instance of a class in one file and then use it in another file, so to speak. And this is what allows me to create an instance of the media element class. And we called it what? Uh, we called it quack media element. And then call its methods and properties here in the code behind without having to create an instance of it or reference it in some way. We were able to just use it. And we were able to use it because it's defined in the class just like we were if had we defined our button inside of the uh, imperative C sharp code that we wrote. And we'll see more examples of this a little bit later in the lesson. All right, so uh, since XAML is essentially an XML document, we can embed elements inside of other elements. So we've already seen an example of this, right? We have this topmost uh, XML element, this phone application page. And if we were to drill down, there is this grid called layout root. And inside of that layout grid, there is this other grid called content panel. All right, and inside of that content panel grid, we created a media element and a button element. All right, so here the phone application page contains a grid and the grid contains a media element and a button. Or perhaps more correctly in XAML parlance, uh, user controls content property is set to grid and the grid's children collection includes the media element and a button. Depending on the type of control that you're working with, the default property can be populated using this embedded style syntax. So what we could do is this. Let's take away this word quack out of the button and set it like so here. Whoops. All right, and it would still work. You can see it the word quack reappear in our designer. Uh, or we can remove it back out and put it back where we originally had it. So we'll remove the content attribute and just set it here because it's a default uh, attribute. Okay, so let's talk about another feature of XAML. We'll talk about complex properties and the property element syntax. So in some cases, merely setting attribute values masks the complexity of what's really going on behind the scenes. And a good example of this is how we set the background of our button equal to red. But if you take a look at the C sharp that was required to do this, we actually created a new instance of an object called the solid color brush, 
which we had to add a using statement because it's in the system.windows.media namespace. So the solid color brush takes a enumeration and we selected the enumeration colors.red, okay? Uh, and this is another example of a property type converter because you know we just were able to use the word red and behind the scenes it did all of this for us. Very cool. But some attributes are simply too complex to be represented as string values like we did here. And to kind of demonstrate this, what I want to do is go ahead and remove the background equal red. And let me put this on a different line as well, okay? And uh, what I want to do is actually go now into the properties pane here on the right-hand side, making sure that my mouse cursor is somewhere here in the button so that makes sure that it's the uh, the context of what we're setting here in the properties window. And I uh, want to make sure that brush is selected and make sure that background is selected. So we're in the brush categories, background, and I'm going to change from the solid color brush to the gradient brush. And you can see when I do that, it shows me a little preview of what the background looks like with the black at the top and the white at the bottom, which is the default. You can see how that's represented over here in our preview. And so now what I'm gonna do is take this little circle and I'm gonna drag it all the way over here to the right-hand side, the upper right-hand corner, which will give me a red color. All right, and so now you can see that it changes from black at the top to red at the bottom and there's a beautiful gradient in between. Uh, and so, you know, pretty much the importance of this is the XAML that's generated here. Uh, no longer do we have a simple property where we can just set background equal to red. Now we have all this generated XAML. Uh, and so it's broken out into its own element. This is called a property element syntax and it's in the form of control.property and it's a child to the control itself. So the button control has this property element syntax to define the button dot pro, uh, background attribute and it's going to define it as a complex series of, uh, of XAML settings. And so here we have a linear gradient brush. The term brush means that we're working with an object that represents a color or many colors. So think of brush like a paintbrush. Now this particular paintbrush will create a gradient that's linear in nature. The color will change from top to bottom or from left to right in kind of an equal, uh, equal proportion, I guess you could say. Now admittedly, you would never want to do what I'm doing in this code example because it goes against the aesthetic of the Windows Phone 8 application guidelines. But let's pretend for now that we're expressing our individuality by uh, using a gradient color as the background color for a button. As you can see here in this code example, if we want to define a linear gradient brush, then we have to supply a lot of information in order for it to render the brush correctly. We have to uh, give it the colors, at what point do we want the colors to start and stop. Uh, we give it a collection of gradient stop objects, uh, what we should, you know, we start with red at, with an offset of one and we go, to, or we start with the black with an offset of zero and move on to red with an offset of one and, and so forth, okay, which uh, basically is the color and their positions inside of a gradient. That's what an offset basically is. However, uh, the XAML representing the linear gradient brush in this code snippet is actually shortened automatically by Visual Studio. Here's what it actually should be. Uh, let me go ahead and modify this example and show you what the long form version is. Notice how the linear gradient brush dot gradient stops collection and the gradient stop collection were omitted whenever we used the, uh, the properties window, the little visual designer that allowed us to choose the, the, the uh, linear gradient. This is done for conciseness and compactness and is made possible by an intelligent XAML parser. First of all, the gradient stops property is the default property for the linear gradient brush. And then next, the gradient stops is, is of type uh, gradient stop collection. 
and implements the uh, I list of T, the T in this case would be of type gradient stop. Given that, it's possible for the XAML parser to deduce that the only thing that could be nested inside of this linear gradient brush is one or more instances of these gradient stops, which are being added implicitly to the gradient stop collection, which is, again, set uh, as the default property for the gradient stops collection of the linear gradient uh, brush, okay? So the moral of the story is that XAML allows us to create instances of classes declaratively, and we have a granular fidelity of control to design user interface elements. Even so, the XAML parser is intelligent enough that it doesn't require us to include redundant code. As long as it has enough information to create this object graph correctly, then it's good to go. All right. Phew. To recap, we learned a lot about the syntax of XAML. Most of XAML is pretty straightforward, but there's a few things that are not quite so obvious. Uh, XAML is simply an implementation of XML, and it relies heavily on schemas and namespaces to adhere to contracts so that different applications can create, interpret, display, or compile the XAML code. Secondly, the purpose of XAML is to allow for a compact, concise syntax to create instances of classes and to set their properties or their attributes. We compared the procedural version of a button created in C-sharp versus one created declaratively in XAML, and we saw how much less code was required to do it that way. Uh, third, XAML requires less code due to its built-in features like property type converters, which allows a simple string value to be converted into an instance of a class. For more complex property settings, like we saw just a moment ago, XAML offers property element syntax, which harnesses the intelligent XAML parser to rely on default properties and deduction to reduce the amount of XAML code required to express a design, like we just saw. And fifth, we learned about the embedded syntax style of the uh, and the embedded nature of elements, which suggests a relationships between visual elements. For example, the phone application page it contains a grid for layout here, and which in turn contains uh, a, a area for our content, which in, in turn contains uh, a number of controls that we've added to our project. And these are represented with opening and closing elements representing containment or ownership. And then uh, finally, we learned about the default properties. Each control has a default property, which can be uh, set using the same style of embedded syntax. Uh, and the good example of this was our value quack, okay? Uh, so that we were able to remove it as an attribute content and just set it as a default property. Okay, so next let's learn more about the grid that we saw here and we've used for layout uh, for the content panel and the grid that kind of uh, wraps it as well as our our topmost area here. Uh, we're going to learn about XAML's attached property syntax and how events are wired up all in the next lesson. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, I want to talk about layout, or in other words, how controls are positioned and arranged on your app's user interface. So my game plan in this lesson is to, first of all, start talking about the two primary elements that are used in layout and positioning. You have the grid element and the stack panel element. As far as the grid element goes, I want to talk about defining rows and columns, and then the various sizing options that you have and techniques that you can use to fully unlock the power of the grid to position your controls anywhere on the uh, the apps user interface and then next I want to learn about the stack panel and just for fun what we're gonna do is convert our pet sounds app from using a grid layout to a stack panel layout and hopefully that'll teach us some of the key differences between using these two different elements for our layout uh, between the grid and the stack panel. And then I want to switch gears away from layout and talk about events. We'll talk about how event handlers are wired up from both a, a XAML and C sharp perspective. So this will be a good lesson. Um, I'm looking forward to it. All right. So uh, 
what I did was I wanted to start fresh so that we can get back to the original default uh, code that is in the uh, phone application project template. So all I did was I went to file, new project, opened up the new project dialog and I selected the Windows Phone app template and I left the name alone and just clicked OK and that's what gave me this this phone app one. So you should do the same sort of thing. And all I really want to do is just take a look at the content panel, which you'll recall from the previous lessons was simply this grid that was used uh, that the intent of which is we is to, to put our controls into it. it represents this area, this large area beneath the application and page names, right? And so we put a button in there and remember it took up the entire area. That's what we're talking about now. So uh, the grid element though, uh, is used for laying out other controls. It allows you to define rows and columns and then each control can request which row and column they want to be placed inside of. Uh, so now in the default main page dot XAML page template between this opening and closing grid tag the grid appears empty right now. It appears that there's no rows or columns defined. However, by default, there's always one row definition and one column definition, even if it's not explicitly defined. And these take up the full vertical and horizontal space available to represent one large cell in the grid. Any items that you place uh, between the opening and closing grid tags are understood to be inside that single implicitly design, uh, defined cell. Uh, another example of a grid that we didn't really use up to now, uh, but it's important, is this layout root here near the very top. And you can see that at the top it actually defines two rows uh, by creating these two row definition elements and setting their heights. All right, We'll ignore the, what the heights are set to just for a second. Um, the there are two rows and the first row contains this stack panel and the second row will contain this content panel. Now the stack panel named title panel, notice how it positions itself or places itself inside of that first row of its parent. Uh, it says grid dot row equals zero. So it puts itself inside of this row that's defined here. And then the content panel positions itself inside of the second row by setting grid.row equals one. That puts it inside of this row, okay? So you reference both rows and columns using a zero base numbering scheme like you saw just then. The first row here, it has its height set to auto and the second row has its height set to an asterisk. So there are three syntaxes that you can use to help persuade the sizing for each row and column. Uh, I use the term persuade intentionally. With XAML layout, heights and widths, widths are relative and can be influenced by a number of different factors. All these factors are considered by the layout engine to determine the actual placement of items on the page. For example, the word auto here, the auto setting, means that the height for the row should be tall enough to accommodate all of the controls that are placed inside of it. If the tallest control is 150 pixels tall, or if the sum of all of the items are 150 pixels tall, then that's the actual height of the row. If it's only 100 pixels, then that's the height of the row. Therefore, auto means the height is relative to the controls that are inside of that row. The asterisk is known as star sizing. Okay, and um, it, it, it means that the height of the row should, should take up all of the rest of the available height, in this case, that's available. All right, so take a look at this little example that I put together before I recorded this video. Yeah, star sizing. And you can see what I've done here, uh, I created a project that has three rows defined. So here I have three rows. And notice the heights of each one. I use one star, two star, three stars, or asterisks. Putting a number before the asterisk is basically saying of all the space that's available, 
give me one or two or three shares of the remaining space available. Now since the sum of all those rows, one, two, and three add up to sixth, one star is basically equivalent to one sixth, two stars is equivalent to two sixths of the height, and three stars is equivalent to three sixths, okay? So therefore three star would get half of the height that's available uh, and so you can see that depicted in the output of this example where the green is taking up roughly half of the available area inside of the content panel, all right? So besides auto and star sizing, you can also specify widths and heights as well as margins in terms of absolute pixels. In fact, uh, when only numbers are present, it represents that number of pixels. Generally, it's not a good idea to use exact pixels in layouts for widths and heights because of the likelihood that screens, uh, even Windows Phone screens, can have different dimensions. Instead, it's preferable to use relative values like auto and star sizing for layout. Now one thing to note from, from this example and from our original Pet Sounds example is that control widths and heights are assumed to be 100% unless otherwise specified. That's why rectangles take up uh, as you can see here, the red, blue, and green rectangles take up the entire cell size. That's why the button, when we added it to the Pet Sounds app, occupied the entire content grid size. And that's why I wanted to specify the button to only be 200 pixels by 200 pixels instead. Uh, I want to also point out that a grid can have a collection of column definitions. Uh, let's take a look at another project I created grid rows and columns, all right? And so here you can see, let me move this over a little bit. Here you can see that I've created a grid with three rows and three columns. So I define rows by using grid.row definitions to create a collection of row definitions, and then I add three row definitions to the collection. I do the same thing with column definitions, adding three column definition objects uh, to my grids column definitions collection okay and then I simply just put a text block in each one of them uh, and so the result is that I have uh, a simple grid with a number inside of each cell the other thing that I want you to notice about this example that's pretty important is that when you don't specify the grid dot row or the grid dot column it's assumed to mean the first row or the first column so that's when I as you see, I don't specify grid column or grid row, but one still winds up in this first cell in the upper left-hand corner. So relying on the defaults helps keep your code a little bit more concise. All right, I have another example here called alignment in margins. And so as you can see, this XAML here all right, we have a number of rectangles that I've created, different colors to help you easily pick them out. Uh, most of this example should be obvious if you stare at it for a few moments, but there's a couple of finer distinctions that I wanna make about alignments and margins. First of all, this example points out how vertical alignment and horizontal alignment work, even in a given grid cell. And the same will hold true in a stack panel as well when we get to that point. The alignment properties, so vertical or horizontal alignment properties, or attributes rather, pull uh, controls towards their boundaries. So alignment attributes pull controls towards their boundaries, whether it be to the top, to the left, the bottom, the middle, or whatever the case might be. By contrast, margin attributes, left margin, top margin, right margin, bottom margin, or their shortened form as you see here, where I can specify all four attributes in a single string. Uh, margins push controls away from their boundaries. So alignments pull towards boundaries, margins push away from boundaries. Uh, the second observation is the odd way in which margins are here defined, like I indicated a moment ago, as a series of numeric values that are separated by commas. This convention was borrowed from cascading style sheets. The numbers represent the margin pixel values in a clockwise fashion, starting from the left side. So if you see something with a margin of 10, 20, 30, 40, that means 10 pixels from the left boundary, 20 pixels from the top boundary, 
30 pixels from the right boundary and 40 pixels from the bottom boundary. A bit earlier I said that it's generally a better idea to use relative sizes like auto and star to define widths and heights for, uh, for rows and columns. Why then are margins uh, defined using pixels instead? Well, margins are expressed in exact pixels because they're usually just small values to provide spacing or padding between two relative values. And so, therefore, they can be a fixed value without negatively impacting the overall layout of the page. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about the stack panel. And uh, it is the second style of layout that's enabled in your phone apps. It'll arrange your controls in a flow from top to bottom or from left to right. Uh, typically from top to bottom since we're dealing with uh, phone apps. Uh, back in our Pet Sounds project, so let me close all these guys down. So back here in our Pet Sounds project, we have the following stack panel created. Uh, it is basically to give us an app title and a page title at the very top of the main page.xaml. Both text block elements take up the entire horizontal width of their parent, the layout root grid, and therefore they're stacked vertically. Uh, so let's do this now. Let's convert our content panel from a grid into a stack panel just to see what will happen. So let's go down here and we're going to change from a grid to a stack panel. And we'll have to change the closing grid to a stack panel. All right. And if we were to run this app, the only thing that really happens, the only thing our conversion seems to accomplish is to move that meow button vertically downward. Now, let me do this. Let's stop the, the app. And what I want to do is remove the uh, horizontal and vertical alignments. Or actually, let's just do this. Let me remove the, uh, the width and the horizontal alignment from our uh, quack button. And I'm also going to remove the uh, this background and move this back to red. So we'll just set background color equal to red again. And let's go to the main page.xaml.cs and what I want to do is just com comment out the width and the horizontal alignment. And I'm going to comment out the margin as well. And furthermore, I'm going to uh, comment out the height and reset it. So my button dot height equals 100. And I will do the same here by setting my play audio button's height to 100. And then I'm going to run the app again. And now you can see that the two buttons are stacked vertically in the stack panel. So as you can see, you can achieve just about any layout that you could imagine by using a combination of four things. Use a grid layout, including row definitions and column definitions. You can use stack panel layout. You can use margins to move well elements away from the left side, the top side, the right side, or the bottom side. Uh, or you can use the horizontal alignment and the vertical alignment attributes to move items towards a particular boundary. Okay, So that's XAML layout in a nutshell. What I want to do next is move on to events. Now if you watch the C-Sharp Fundamental series on Channel 9, in one of the final videos we talked about events. In the Windows Phone API, pages and controls raise events for key moments in their life cycle or uh, they raise events whenever a user interacts with a given control or page. Uh, in this series, we've already wired up the click event handler of our play audio button with a method. So we navigate to the event handler, a method that I called an event handler. Now, when I use the term event handler, I'm merely referring to a method, just like we see here, that's associated with an event. 
I use the term wired up to mean that the event is tied to a particular event handler method. Now, some events can be triggered by a user, like the click event of a button control. Other events happen during the lifetime uh, uh, of a given control or page, like the loaded event that occurs after the page or the control object has been instantiated uh, at runtime. All right. Okay. So there are two ways to wire up an event for a page or a control to an event handler method. The first is to set it using the attribute syntax of XAML. Now, we've already done this in our play audio button example. Um, Remember this right here, okay? If you recall, we typed click equals double quote, and then before we typed in the closing double quotation mark, IntelliSense asked us if we wanted to select or create an event handler. Now we told it we wanted to create a new event handler in Visual Studio named the event handler using the naming convention, name of the element, underscore the event name. So in our case, it was play audio button, underscore click. Visual Studio also created this method stub in the code behind, in the .cs file version of our main page class. Uh, and you know, keep in mind that these are Visual Studio automations. We could have hit the escape key on our keyboard and said, no, 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 IntelliSense, we don't want you to handle this. We'll just do everything ourselves whenever IntelliSense first pops up. We could type all this in by hand, uh, but Honestly, that's a little bit difficult. I just let IntelliSense do its work. As long as everything's named correctly, I follow the convention that it wants to follow. That's cool. Uh, so the second way to associate an event with an event handler is to use the properties window in Visual Studio. So for example, uh, let's get back over here and I'm just gonna put my cursor somewhere in the button and then go to the properties window. And in the properties window, by default, it shows the properties for the, or the attributes for the item that we have selected. But there's also this little uh, lightning bolt icon to the right hand side of it. And when you select that, it shows you all of the possible events that are available for this particular element. Uh, so the name of the element will appear here at the very top, and that gives you the, pro the, the proper context for what you're going to be setting next. In other words, any settings that you make will be to this play audio button as opposed to something else on this page. If you were to double click a particular, uh, a particular text box inside of this list of all the items that could be, uh, that could be changed, then it will create an association between that controls event and a new event handler. Uh, double clicking will automatically name the event and create a method stub for you in the code behind. So just for, for fun, what you could do, let's just take loaded for example, and I'll double click loaded. And notice what happens. Uh, first of all, it adds this loaded attribute equal play audio button underscore loaded in our XAML. And then it also created this stubbed out event handler method called play audio button loaded. All right. And that was all just by going to here and then double clicking inside of here. All right. So let's go ahead and get rid of all of this because I don't want that. And you notice it when I removed it from the events uh, tab of the properties window, it removes the XAML, but I'll have to delete the rest by hand. All right, so the third technique that, that we'll use several times in the series in order to wire up an event with an event handler method is to wire it up uh, in C-sharp code. So let's do this. What I wanna do is take my, uh, my button that we've defined here, and I'm gonna go my button dot click and then I'm gonna use the plus equal, and then you can see I can, it'll give me a little hint here that I can use the tab button to insert a new my button underscore click event, and then I could tab once more for it to actually create that method stub, and then for me to, uh, to, be, uh, to start typing in that uh, method stub. However, that's not what I'm gonna do this time. I'm gonna hit the escape key on my keyboard. I'm gonna type in play audio button underscore click. All right, because that is already uh, defined here in our code. So the plus equal operator can be used in other contexts to mean add and set. So for example, x plus equal one is the same as typing in x equals x plus one. The same is true here, basically. We want to add and set the click event to one more event handler method. 
So yes, the click event of my button can be set to trigger the execution of multiple event handlers all at the same time. So one click event could trigger one or more methods executing. Now in our app, I'd anticipate that only, uh, only that this one event handler, play audio button click, would execute. You might wonder, uh, why doesn't that line of code look something like this? With an open and close parentheses. Notice that the open and close parentheses on the end of the underscore click, uh, recall from the C Sharp Fundamental series that the open and close uh, parentheses is the method invocation operator. In other words, when we use the open and close parentheses, we're telling the runtime to execute the method on that line of code immediately. But that's not what we want in this instance. We only want to associate or point to the play audio button underscore click method. Okay, so just to clarify, because a user had a question about that previously, and I want to make sure to make that point emphatically. Uh, one of the other interesting notes about event handler methods, with my addition of, uh, of line number 35 in the code here, uh, I now have two events both pointing to the same event handler method, uh, play audio button click. And that's perfectly legitimate. How then can we determine which button actually triggered the execution of the method? Well, if you take a look at the declaration for the play audio button underscore click, there's two input parameters. The Windows Phone runtime will pass along the sender as an input parameter. Now, since we can associate this event with any control, the sender is of type object, okay? Uh, it's the type that virtually all data types in .NET uh, framework ultimately derive from. And so one of the first things that we need to do is uh, a few checks to determine the actual data type. Are you a button? Are you a rectangle control? And so on. And then we would cast this sender object to that specific data type. And once we cast the object to a button, for example, then we can access the button's properties and so on. All right, so that's how one event method could, could handle multiple events from different controls pointing to it, all right? The method signature in the code snippet is typical of methods in the Windows Phone API. In addition to the sender input parameter, parameter there's also this routed event args type that's used uh, for those events that pass along extra information. And you'll see how these are used in advanced scenarios. However, I don't believe that we're going to use them at all in this series, at least not that I can think of at this early stage. Okay, so to recap, the big takeaway in this lesson was the ways in which we can influence the layout of pages and controls. We looked at the grid and stack panel layout. We, with regards to the grid layout, we learned about the different ways to define the heights and the widths of rows and columns, respectively, using auto sizing, star sizing, and pixel sizing. We talked about how vertical alignment and horizontal alignment pull controls toward boundaries while margins push controls away from boundaries. Then we talked about the different ways to wire up events to event handler methods like we just talked about and the anatomy of event handler methods input parameters like sender and routed event RZ. Okay? So at this point, our Pet Sounds project is working. However, because if we run it right now, both of our buttons will quack uh, like a duck, and it's not all that useful, right? Uh, can you think of some ways in which we could correct this problem? Uh, it's actually pretty simple. We'll do it in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.